Well, like, welcome folks, this is Mr. Bergman, podcast 2.1.5, Structural Geology. Structural, we're going to talk structures. What do things look like underneath the ground? That's what we're going to talk about, the structure of the world. Notice here in this picture here, the picture from your textbook, that there are things all bent, bent around in like curves. And so we're going to talk about curvies today. So let's uh, get on with it today, okay? All right, lots of definitions today as we get in here. First of all, what is structural geology? Well, it's the study of three-dimensional. What does that mean in three dimensions? That means it has a length, a width, and a height. All right, distribution of rock units, which we learned about in our last unit, with respect to their deformational, deformation, big word, that means they're changed in their shape histories. The primary goal of structural geology is to use measurements, measurements, are you going to measure things with like rivers and things like that, of present day rock geometries to uncover information about the history of the deformation in the rocks. So basically we want to look at the rocks today and determine what they were like in the past. And what they tell about it in the past tells us interesting things about the rocks and actually helps us to find things like oil. We'll talk about that as we progress here. Hey, to start out with, I want to introduce you to Dr. Randy Merritt. He is a structural geologist, and he's going to talk to you about structural geology. Huh, think about it. A structural geologist talking about structural geology? Who would have thunk of it? I'm uh, Randy Merritt. I'm a geology professor here at the University of Texas. The research that I do is called structural geology, but what that actually means is that I study the deformation of rocks. Of course, you can't squeeze a rock in your hands very much, but the earth can squeeze rocks a lot. The manifestations of that deformation in terms of things that you can see without a microscope or any special tools uh, primarily take the form of folds uh, where various features inside of the rock get deflected so that they make roughly wave kind of shapes. Uh, but then rocks can also break so that various types of fractures form inside of the rock. Probably one of the more familiar versions of that is a fault where earthquakes take place. Earthquakes are one of the more dramatic versions of deformation of rock um, and what's happening in that case is that the fault itself divides the earth into roughly halves and the rock on one side of the fault suddenly moves relative to the rock on the opposite side of the fault and it moves so suddenly that things analogous to sound waves go propagating out into the surrounding rock and human beings sense shaking associated with earthquakes. The uh, locations where I do most of my research are uh, in mountains. So I do a lot of work in the Andes in South America, do a lot of work in the Sierra Madre Oriental in northeastern Mexico, and in various locations of the Rocky Mountains in the United States. From a geological point of view, one of the advantages of working in mountains, of course, is that lots of rocks are exposed there. If we were there a couple million years ago, we would find that the locations where you can now walk around would have been uh, hundreds of meters or even kilometers underground. So in a sense, we're literally walking around inside of the earth. When we're out there looking at the rocks, the kinds of things that we're paying attention to, to be able to uh, make observations that are pertinent to the deformation of them, are the orientations of various features uh, inside of the rock, such as fault orientation, um, or the orientation of layers that have been folded. Um, and for those sorts of observations, uh, we use a compass. Another fundamental thing is where the structure is. So that when I'm walking around doing field work, almost invariably in one of my hands, I've got a notebook that has maps showing the topography of the earth or aerial photographs of the earth. and I partly use those just to navigate as I'm walking around in the field, but then in addition to that, uh, I use them as the base on which to record my observations. Well, ultimately, the goal of geology is 
to understand how the earth works. And innumerable processes are taking place, some of which people are aware of. Every time a landslide occurs or a flood or a volcanic eruption, that's essentially the earth in the process of living its own life. So the goal of geology is to understand how those processes work and how we can avoid the hazards that they impose upon us, how we can affect various parts of the planet ourselves and learn to mitigate uh, the effects that we have on our own environment. Well, wasn't he cool? It is cool to hear uh, Dr. Randy talk about stuff and what he learns. Let's kind of uh, put some meat on what he kind of already visited about. Let's talk about what a fault is. A fault. Now, we've already, already kind of talked about faults when we talked about earthquakes, but hey, let's talk about this. It's a fracture surface along which rocks slip. There's several varieties of faults, but we can see here how we have a, a body of land. The green represents a particular, uh, the, well, the ground, but the brown is a particular variety of rock. And this, um, right here has shifted down and also to um, the backside. Well, so there's been a shifting or a fault. That's a fault. But it turns out there are lots of different kinds of situations. Now, we need to talk, before we talk about faults, we need to talk about the three varieties of forces. There are tension forces, compression forces, and shear forces. Now, tension is like when you play tug of war. So when you're playing tug of war with your um, uh, friends or whatever, right? Here's somebody over here playing tug of war. You are fighting each other, so it's in tension. Does that make sense? Tension has to do with tug of war. So forces that are going away from each other. Compressional forces are forces that are coming towards each other. All right. So if you're like pushing on a wall or something like that, or just um, two things pushing together, and then shear forces is when the forces are in opposite direction. Um, you might kind of think about this as we talked about in uh, plate tectonics. Tension forces are divergent forces. Compression forces are convergent forces, and shear forces are transform forces. Okay. Now it turns out there are uh, several varieties of faults. For example, there's a normal fault, a reversed or a thrust fault, etc. Let's kind of talk about each of these one at a time. Here's what a normal fault or normal fault or a normal fault is. It occurs when tension forces, we talk about that in a minute, right? Act in opposite directions and cause one slab of the rock to be displaced up and the other down. Now take a look at my animation that's been playing for a while. Notice how the left one right here is being thrust up, okay? Going up. Okay, up, and the other one is going down. There's, so this contact point right through here, that, of course, is the fault li line. Right? There is actually you know, this uh, uh, tension force. Right? Remember, there's this uh, separating force. But it's, it's causing the rocks to slip downward. But see, the force is here uh, uh, listed in the red um, coloration there, which is causing it to um, separate. It's really not that there's an upward or a downward force as much as there is a tensional force which is causing the normal fault to occur. The second is called a reverse fault. Now the reverse fault looks just, well, the reverse of a normal fault. It develops when the compression forces, compression, that means together. Notice how the red arrows are both pointing towards each other. The compressional forces exist. Compression causes one block to be pushed up and over the other block. This is how you kind of get the hanging cliffs. Imagine seeing what this looks like out in nature. See how we're going to get a hanging cliff right here. This is going to be above this piece right here. And now that's how we can get that kind of a force or that kind of a, a structure, structural geology. Okay, a strike slip fault. A fault in which the surfaces of opposite sides of the fault plane have moved horizontally and parallel to the strike of the fault. Now what the heck does that mean? Well, let's take a look at an animation that helps, helps us explain it.